run uh, uh, our second PCS uh, seminar during this week. Uh, and uh, to have uh, the speaker Andreas Zinner with us. Uh, and let me say a few words uh, about uh, Andreas. Uh, he uh, has a very interesting uh, uh, academic background uh, or uh, not very usual one, I would say. So he did uh, an undergrad study uh, and then did a postgraduate study uh, finishing this with a PhD in electrical engineering in, uh, at the Kazan State University of Technology in Russia, jointly also with the University of Applied Science of Düsseldorf through some academic exchange uh, program, which uh, he finished in 1999. And then he moved permanently to Germany and uh, uh, and uh, started to uh, go into physics. So he did again then his uh, undergrads and uh, master in physics uh, at the University of Braunschweig, uh, supervised by uh, Professor Werner, Reinhard Werner. And then he moved uh, from there on to the University of Frankfurt to uh, Peter Kopitz where he uh, did fin finished his PhD in 2009. And then he moved on from there to uh, the University of Augsburg uh, into the research group of uh, Professor Klaus Ziegler. And while being there, he finished his habilitation, which is uh, uh, higher than PhD degree uh, issued in a number of countries, including Germany. And he did that, and uh, that is still where he is. Uh, he is a research uh, associate and a, a lecturer at the Institute of Physics at the University of Augsburg. Right, and today he will uh, tell us about his uh, recent results on uh, topological transitions in anisotropic honeycomb lattices and effective follow models for the whole transition. He is also an expert, I think, on uh, interesting superconductivity related uh, topics, but I'm not sure whether you will touch that during your uh, talk here, but uh, that might be of interest for some of you uh, if you want to stay uh, with us uh, after the, so to say, official uh, part of the seminar and uh, uh, join the after after seminar discussion. Okay, with that, uh, I think I said enough. So Andreas, the floor is yours, please. And uh, Juzar, uh, I think you have, did you prepare this? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's quite a good idea. So the floor is mine, I start. So thank you very much for having me today. So my name is Andreas Zina and I'm going to say some words about a couple of our works, mainly on topological transition and anisotropic conicum lattices and effective one models. So basically all that stuff has been done in collaboration with my dear fellow colleagues, mostly Professor Ziegler and Yuri Lozovic, Antonio Hill and Fusit, Nuo Pucit. And um, well, basically this is the outline of my talk and all, the, all this stuff which I'm going to talk about is to some extent roughly technical. I will try to keep it as simple as possible. I hope uh, not too simple. Well, um, I'm going to, well, basically I'm going briefly through this outline and start talking or explaining what basically the differences between isotropic and anisotropic lattices and what is different in, in terms of transport on such lattices, then I'm going to switch to more complicated or involved problems, but this is all keeping the technical level as possible, as simple as possible. Well, and uh, at the very end, I have, of course, to say some word about our money gear. It's Julian Schwinger Foundation, which um, supported our research for a couple of years. And well, good, I'm now switching to the actual part of my talk. So here we go, topological transition, anisotropic nicop lattices. And in order to introduce the anisotropic lattices, uh, anisotropic honeycomb lattices, I will start the isotropic lattices. So basically graphene is probably the most well-known example of such things. 
So basically here is shown, so schematically, the isotropic honeycomb lattices. And the main difference or the feature of such lattice is that it is not a Bravé lattice. It is not reducible in that sense. It can be thought of being um, of consists of two triangular lattices. You can see the above triangular lattices here. And if you look at the structure of electronic Houghton processes between uh, ne next nearest um, atoms of such lattices, you can recognize that those Houghton processes take place between above sub lattices. In that sense, a sub lattice, sub lattice plays a role in effective degree of freedom. And if you bring the simplest uh, binding Hamiltonian, which is given here, or basically a Houghton process between some uh, lattice sites D, or basically maybe blue, mm -hmm. sorry? To a sub lattice, to a, to a position on the lattice C, maybe red line, you can recognize that it is basically a quadratic form. And the matrix in between, well, you can bring this Hamiltonian into a two by two matrix form. And if you diagonalize a two by two matrix, what you get is two eigenvalues, or let's say two bands, which you can see here, more or less schematically. One band corresponding to positive energy, one band corresponding to negative energies. And what happens to those both bands is that they touch each other at precisely six corners of the hexagonal brillion zone. So basically a hexagon is to some extent an as a so invariant a construction remains invariant under Fourier transformation or basically the Fourier transformation can diagonalize such a translational invariant Hamiltonian. And the important thing is yet again that both bands touch each other at precisely six corners of this brilliant zone. And close to those points, close to those points, the dispersion of the spectrum is linear. This is why we are talking about the Dirac Hamiltonians. I'm, I'm sorry, Dirac Hamiltonians, and this is the Dirac Hamiltonian shown here. Now, the main problem with this Hamiltonian is that you can recognize it is not real symmetric. So this Hamiltonian, this tight binding Hamiltonian is real symmetric, it's not even emission, it is real symmetric because nothing breaks time reversal symmetry in this, but a Dirac Hamiltonian is not. So we have an apparent problem. We have an apparent conflict between both the representations. So we have to assume, urgently assume, that those uh, Dirac points, or so Dirac points appear always in pairs. Yeah? You can see it also here. Yeah? It is degenerated. We have one Dirac cone, we have second Dirac cone, and the both Dirac ones are not simply appear in pairs, but they should be related to each other by what people call the chiral symmetry, which basically means that they are complex conjugate to each other. And this complex conjugations allows us to maintain the real symmetry of the Hamiltonian such that we don't have this problem. And this simple fact is related in the literature to what people usually call the nielsen nanomir theorem. So basically given a simple tight binding model, bringing it into the uh, reciprocal space, you have all these, those nodal points, if they appear, they always appear in pairs. And they are not simply replica of each other, they differ by this, they are related to each other by this chiral symmetry. So this is the isotropic lattice. Now what happens on anisotropic lattice? By the way, we will see later how it can be shown, let's say so on, on a graph cartoon or something like this. Isotropic lattice. Now I'm going to anisotropic lattices. And first, I want to explain what I mean by anisotropic lattices. So here are two cells of a signal isotropic lattice. And if we peak, peak pinpoint, let's say, so this central atom, we can recognize that an anisotropic lattice is the hopping processes or hopping amplitudes towards each neighboring atom is precisely the same. So we cannot really dis distinguish or let's just distinguish in the amplitude of this helping process T1 to T2, T3. There is a certain symmetry, this C3 symmetry, which basically allows us to rotate the lattice by each time degree of 120 degrees and nothing changes in the model. Yeah? Uh, sorry, uh, Andreas. Sorry. Oh, yeah. There's a question. There's a by question by Alexei. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Alexei, unmute yourself, please. Yeah. Uh, sorry, a very simple question. So, what I mean, from what you were saying, I had the impression that the fact that these Dirac cones appear in pairs is a consequence of chiral symmetry. So is it then impossible to generate a Dirac cone in a system that doesn't have chiral symmetry or? You mean, uh, is it impossible to generate such a system where they appear once, you know, let's say so in, in odd numbers? So 
rather my question is um so if i i could imagine well at least i don't immediately see why i cannot just fine-tune a system mm -hmm. to have a direct code and not have a chiral symmetry so in that case uh, in as much as i understood this uh doesn't seem to be any well, chiral sim since chiral symmetry is not there, it cannot enforce the appearance of a second, of a pair, um, of a second. No, but pole. in this particular case, you know, basically the appearance of these two, well, the appearance of a single direct node is due to the sublattice symmetry in all the mechanical blotters. You have two, yeah. well, basically two sublattices, you can't really uh, distinguish between them both. So this is what, what guarantees the appearance of one particular diagram. Now, because again, this Hamiltonian is real symmetric, right? in order to pre preserve the real symmetry of this Hamiltonian also in reciprocal space, it is necessary to have uh, let's say so pairwise appearance of, of those direct coins. Of course, you can upgrade this Hamiltonian, this simple Hamiltonian by some additional terms, but basically held in date. And uh, I'm going to talk about this later, but in this simplest form, there is nothing to be fine-tuned in order to, to break this parallel symmetry. You have to uh, well, update this semitonic with some additional let's say, so, uh, terms which describe this may, maybe um, textures or maybe something like You have well, to that's... effectively break the time reversal symmetry, yes? Okay, so I mean, if I break, well, if I fine-tune and break time reversal symmetry, then I can have individual direct cones. That's basically all I want. It's basically what, what Holden's theorem says, yes. I'm going to, to say some words about it later. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. So, may I continue? All right, yeah, now, okay. yeah, uh, again, it's it's again the situation of isotropic lattices. If I want to be, bring in anisotropy on this lattice, I have to assume that one of these hopping parameters is larger, become may become larger than the two above, both uh, remaining ones. And so, without restricting or losing any kind of symmetry or um, general assumptions, I will always assume T1. So in this the so-called armchair configuration, it is this T1 hopping parameter applied alongside the uh, Y direction. Eh? This is the X direction, this is the Y direction. And so I'm assuming that this T1 becomes larger than one, and one being the hopping parameter on isotropic lattices. Now, if I do this, what I can see is that you can recognize here on, on this red line, this red spectrum, that if as this uh, anisotropy increases, what happens is that the both Dirac coins start moving against each other. You can see it also here in this cartoon. So this picture corresponds to isotropic lattice. As this anisotropy increases, the both points, dark points here, start moving to, against each other. And this motion keeps going and going and going until at some point, well, basically precisely if T1 to T, well, basically, uh, well, your phanisotropy is precisely twi two, uh, twice the hopping parameter on isotropic lattices above the Dirac-Cohen's merge. Now, what, what happens then in, if they merge is that uh, instead of this dirac what appears is such a spectrum. It's still a nodal spectrum. It is still, it still has a point where two bands touch each other, but it is highly anisotropic in that sense. It's parabolic in one direction, it is linear in yet another direction. And what is more important, what is more important, that uh, if you are talking about the Dirac cones, you can always attach an issue of Dirac, or not Dirac, but phase to each, to such a uh, Dirac node, and uh, which basically means that such a Dirac um, spectrum has a chiral charge. I'm going to show it some, some, some more. Uh, pictures now, and this topological charge is completely gone if the both neighboring Dirac points has fused as a, well, merged with each other. Now, uh, some words about this topological charge in order to not to be uh, basically empty in words. How we can show this topological charge? Well, the simplest thing is just to take this very embedded vector potential, it is always also can be dubbed the, or called the Betty connection and overlay it with a reciprocal space. Okay. So um, the arrows, the arrows show in this particular case, the Betty poten vector potential, and uh, you can also recognize the structure of the reciprocal space. Again, this is precisely the same 
situation of these three cartoons, we have an isotropic lattice and then something happens to, to this isotropy or basically the isotropy is, is moved. So these topological structures which appear are those wells or this is all <coughs> vortex structures. We can recognize that there are two vortices in the reciprocal space. It's not real time, <clears throat> real space vortices, it's reciprocal vortices, and they curl around the singularity of a phase function. They curl at pre around precisely the position of the direct points. Right? So basically what we mean by this topology, it is basically a first recipe. If you see such a vortex structure, no matter real space, reciprocal space, and we can always guess there is something with topological. Right? Because we can always choose this uh, contour, be it real space, be it reciprocal space, which uh, run, runs quite around the center of such a vortex. And if we perform an integration around this contour, we will always have a finite number. It's, it's something like a phase. And the interesting thing is that this contour does not depend. It's, it's, it's purely, it's absolutely arbitrary. We can choose it at, we are pleased to, the number will be always the same. This is what people usually call it's topological. It does not depend on precise form of this integration contour. Now, this is the, again, the isotropic situation. And now we start shift above Dirac coins against each other. What we recognize is that those vortex structures are still there. So are still there, which basically means the topological invariance remained under a smooth transformation of the system. And they only have gone if the both direct points merge with each other. At this particular case, where the, all, the situ, all the information about the chirality or not correlated, by the way, it is also a, a good uh, um, demonstration of chirality, what it is, is if, if the both direct coin, coins merge with each other, then the full information about these vortices have gone. What we have is a rather boring structure of direct. Of, of very vector potential. So it's it's topologically say completely for the situation. No? Uh, sorry, Andreas, a quick question. So this transition that you see, is this a continuous transition in uh... just a continuous transition? You apply okay. this with pressure, yeah. basically okay. it's something like the pressure, and it continuously mm -hmm. moves the both direct points okay. against each other. It's uh, sometimes people call it the Lipschitz transition, especially people from high energy. Well, it is a not the end of a um, story because it's only some some sort of phenomenology. What we want to see is, uh, of course, the transport. How what kind of physics can we get from this kind of let's say so phenomenology? And for this, I would like to draw your attention to this point and to this point. Right? Those are the points where the subtle subtle points, the subtle points structures in reciprocal space space reside, and subtle points are basically those points where the Gradient, the yeah, gradient in this focal space vanishes, yeah, which basically means at this point, at this energy, you will have some peak like structures in observable quantities, some Van Hoeven related structures. Now, as we start move or shift above direct points against each other, you can recognize that the coloring scheme of these those points change. Something happens to them. Question is, what happens to them? And for this reason, we go into the brilliant zone. No? into the middle of a brilliant zone, the so-called gamma points, going from this gamma point to the position of one of the first uh, subtle point, then to the point K where the Dirac point resides, and then to a second subtle point, and then go back again. So basically, in this way, we go through the two neighboring subtle points. Just look at them, what, what happens to them if we start shifting the both Dirac points against each other. So basically, this process. And what we recognize is well, basically a red line here, probably you can see it and distinguish it. It is a uh, band structure of isotropic lattice. In this particular case, above subtle points, you can recognize them here, it's the position of M1 and M2, they're precisely at the same height. They are degenerated. You cannot really distinguish between the subtle points. If you move above Dirac coins a bit against each other, the brown line, what happens is that this the generator of subtle points is lifted. Now, one subtle point is moved upward, a bit upward. The second one is moved downward. So basically, you create a gap between the both subtle points. And this process basically keeps 
going and going and going as you move the both direct points against each other until at this emergent point of fusion, né? one of the satellite points is simply shifted down to a Fermi surface. We have to deal, we deal with fermions. So it's, it's shifted up to the uh, Fermi surface and we can expect that something happens to observable quantities. This phenomenology must be seen also on the level of observable quantities. Now let's look what it is. Well, we decide to study the AC conductivity, so optical conductivity in this particular case. And then we recognize that the optical conductivity is very much dependent on the way in which direction we look. So if you look in the direction of applied strength, of, of applied anisotropy, it's y direction, uh, we observe one picture. If you look in the direction perpendicular to that, we observe yet another picture. Now to, to a picture. So again, we shift, shift one of the subtle points upward, we shift another subtle point down. What, what happens What happens in the direction of applied strength is that indeed this one who is singularity, one who is singularity, this red one, splits into two. Yeah? So you basically have this splitting because of the but it's also lifted the generacy of subtle points. Uh, you have a splitting in the one hover singularity. And this distance, or it's a gap between above one hover singularity, increases even larger and larger and larger until at the point of fusion here, you, you see this, this uh, blue line, it locks completely the second uh, subtle point, uh, which basically means that the subtle point is shifted on the Fermi surface, and you observe here this huge. Um, divergence in the conductivity. So basically the conductivity goes up to the ceiling. You have a very good conductor in one direction, but basically you can even think it to be a superconductor in one direction. And in another direction, the direction perpendicular to applied strain, it's, the situation is quite different because you don't you don't really observe the splitting of, of the fun of singularity and simply due to the structure of the pole, of the interaction pole. But at the, precisely at the point of fusion, eh, you see that conductivity is suppressed. Eh? It, it, it goes down to zero. So basically what you have at the point of fusion is that the system effectively becomes one dimensional. It's, it's only conducting in one dimension. It is not conducting in another, it's insulating in another direction. It is interesting to see. So, questions? Sorry, Andreas. Yes, uh, just a quick question. Uh, so here, what you're doing is basically the y, y direction hopping term. You're always increasing it. Yes. With respect to the T. What what if yes. we were to decrease this? Uh, would you well, say basically something it's, similar? It's very much the same situation. So I don't have here any, any pictures here, but you, you still have also this situation because if you increase down to zero, one of, of you basically you, you cut in pieces your effectively you cut in pieces your brittle structure. No? You you only let's say so allow to hope yes, the electrons. But, so well, what, what I'm confused with, with is that if I was to take T1 going to zero, I'm basically yes. not having any Y direction hopping. Yeah, you, so why, why it, should you have a conductivity then? I mean, uh, in the Y direction, if there's no hopping term in the Y direction. No, 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 this is what I, I didn't, no, 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 I didn't mind this. I, I, I mean, if you, let's say, so if you increase the barrier, potential barrier between, let's say, so keep growing, 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 so basically you're, um, do not allow electrons to hop in this particular direction. So basically what happens, you, you simply cut your two-dimensional system yes. in wires, mm -hmm. right? which, right. which only exactly. conduct in mm -hmm. a, a, a particular direction. But it's, well, you, you can do it as well. It is simply not so interesting because of some uh, additional things. Um, mm -hmm. I can say some words later. Right? Okay. okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea is here to see, to see that this divergence here, this divergence in one direction and basically suppression of the conductivity in our direction is not arbitrary. It obeys some power law. Yeah? Basically, it diverges as one over the frequency of, let's say so, inside an incident light and in the upper side direction, perpendicular direction, it is suppressed as square root of, of, the, of, of the frequency. So product of above conductivities, product of above conductivities because of the opposite sign of the uh, exponent, the effective exponent it goes to some constant value. And this is interesting to see against what constant value does it always go. So for this reason, it is um, necessary to look at DC conductivity and conductivity far infrared limit. And this conductivity is plotted here as a function of anisotropy. 
No? So basically, this T is, is, is hopping parameter in this perpendicular direction, and T1, uh, T1 is, is, is hopping in, in perpendicular direction, and T is, is basically hopping element on isotropic lattices. So it is logarithmically plotted. This is why it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. And what we can observe, uh, upper, upper line is the conductivity in y direction, the lower line is conductivity in x direction. That, uh, again, this conductivity rises to infinity at the point of fusion, and this one drops to zero. But the way how it rises and this drops to zero is precisely symmetric against each other. You can always, to every given value of another to be, another to be, you can always see this nice relation that the product of both conductivities at every given point, at every given another to be, the product of both conductivities, the square root of them, is restricted or is bounded to the conductivity of graphene, let's say, so this uh, well known, uh, famous. Um, universal conductivity of graphene, which was given the Nobel Prize for, you know, for measurement of this thing. So usually people, sometimes people call it something like uh, geometric average. And this is very interesting because well, some people give us credit for being the first in this case. And uh, after the publication of these results, there were some sub sub subsequent activities. People looked at all the possible as I saw, cases, uh, measurement cases, and uh, theoretically and also experimentally. And um, well, in respect to experiment, it is always interesting to look how the transport properties relate to optical properties, you know, because the optical coefficients, like transparency or reflectance of some particular samples, they are related to each other. And for this reason, we have proposed uh, an experiment how to measure and so on, what to expect from the measurement of optical quantities and experiments. So this is the setup. So here in the middle, you can recognize our graphene sample. And the black arrow, the black arrow shows, uh, emphasizes the direction of applied strength. It is the direction of applied strength, the direction in which we tear our, so, so to speak, our sample apart. Y direction is the direction of, let's say, so parallelization. So we measure, we always measure this angle phi with respect to, uh, to the axis X. And uh, say plot the uh, transmittance and also the absorbance or uh, absorption in such a system as a function of this incident by uh, angle phi. So if we start with a situation with where this phi is zero, we have a precise situation where the vector of applied strength is perpendicular, shows perpendicular to the vector of uh, polarization of incident light. Of, let's say so. Um, light wave polarization. In this particular case, it is the light is parallel, is parallel to the direction which basically it is always all, what I'm talking about is the situation of the point of fusion. Yeah? So, so for phi equals to zero, the light sees something which is very badly conducting in electrical sense. And bad conductor might be very good optical may have very good optical properties no? because all the let's say, so orbitals, electronic orbitals are simply localized. And this is also what we can observe because in this particular case, the transmitters go up to 100%. If we now start rotating our sample, start rotating our sample, we can get in the situation where the both, let's say so both uh, vectors, so the vector of polarization and the vector of applied strength coincide in, 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 in the space. And this is the situation where the light sees something which is very good conducting, and good conductors are usually very bad in terms of optical quantities. So this is, again, what we can re recognize here for deep infrared, we see here the transmittance dropping almost to zero. So our uh, message is here, just by picking up a good angle between, let's say, so polarization of our light and let's say, so applied strain in our anisotropic graphene, we can create a thick, uh, one atom thick, thick uh, filter, which is basically have uh, uh, ability and ability to, to, for transmit, to transmit light or to, to, to change the light transmittance from 100% to almost 0%. And this was not only our theoretical uh, discussion that has been measured recently by a group from uh, those people here in China. So basically, 
looked at uh, not at graphene but at uh, black phosphorus and by applying say it's also a nodal material black phosphorus by applying some straight strength or so um, strain to, to, to this material they indeed observed all this stuff which we are talking here about so this is more or less uh, as the end of my first part and now i'm going to switch to a second part an effective phono model for hull transition so and before i'm starting to explain what we have done i just want to explain what we expect we understand by hull transition and it is known or basically going back to uh, alexey's questions that if you open up a gap open up a gap in such a dirac cone open up a gap in such a single dirac cone which has no chiral counterpart in the spectrum, then you can recognize that this gap on the level of, of Hamiltonian appears in the form of Dirac mass. So here are the two entries in this matrix which differ in the sign, this minus sign, and also it can have a different sign. And this is not so innocent, the appearance of this gap, because just because of appearance of this, this gap parameter, the Hamiltonian reduces its symmetry. It is, it breaks the so-called chiral symmetry and basically it is, it does not compute with the sigma three matrix, which is basically a generator of the chiral symmetry group. And if you, the system sort of, let's say so, transporting such a system feels this reduction in the symmetry and reacts to this by inducing a current, the Noether current due to the Noether theorem. And this current, we have a two dimensional system just happens to be a Hull current, right? It flows in the upper side in perpendicular direction to apply voltage, voltage. And if you apply some voltage, you can calculate also the transport quantities or the transport coefficients, the real uh, linear response from the Kubo formula and some of this. And what you get is this formula where omega is a frequency or energy of insulated light or applied voltage and so on and so on. And what you can say, that if you go, let this omega go to zero, so go into a far infrared regime, what you get is simply a quantized whole conductivity, quantized whole conductivity, which interestingly does not, does not depend on the size of the gap. Now, the size of the gap, the amplitude, the magnitude of this gap does not appear here whatsoever. What appears here is only the sign of a gap because, well, if you are used to think in terms of Zeeman magnetism, a B, well, basically a magnetic field which couples to the Z3 matrix might show in this direction or that direction, it basically might have two different signs. And this is precisely what this signum M gives us, us the idea about. So it's, it's a quantized value, which is only expressed in terms of natural constants, the so-called von Kuitzen constant. It's okay, it's also interesting that here at the edge of this, this mass parameter at the, at the edge of this mass parameter, you will have this logarithmic divergence. You know, There's basically also an idea how to measure a gap in such a systems. Now, the problem is that we have considered here so far only one direct point, and they always appear in pairs again, and those pairs are not precisely the replica of each other, they have opposite correlatives. This basically means if we create a gap with the same sign at above Dirac points, well, the chirality gives you an idea in which direction the current flows. So if the sign of the mass is the same at both Dirac nodes, what we have in this particular case is the current which results or arises from this Dirac point flows in opposite direction to the current which is generated by this point. So they basically are in counter, uh, they flow against each other, they basically add to a zero, they annihilate each other and we don't have any, any, any macroscopic current in such a system. So you can't, on a regular lot, you can't measure any Hull conductivity. And this was the idea by Haldane, or basically also a Nobel Prize winning idea, that if we somehow manage to create a gap which changes the sign from one cone to, to, to another, then in addition to this chiral symmetry, you also get an, an additional degree of freedom, which makes, as you saw, the current from this, say from this uh, cone to flow in the same direction. And so basically you can create a situation where both currents flow in the same direction and they do not eradicate each other, they do not annihilate each other, they add to some finite or so uh, macroscopic value, which can be measurable. 
and well, it was good idea enough to get in a build place essentially. Now we have always to do with, in, in our case, with a system with a subplot asymmetry. And the very present presence of those Dirac points is due to the subplot asymmetry. Now, question is, is it impossible somehow to take the oscillation of these sublattices and to drive them somehow and to get into the situation where the subplot asymmetry is broken and maybe it's going to be a, a massive phase and maybe we can by chance have a situation where those, bus, uh, those masses, uh, well, basically it's something like an oscillating mass all over the uh, real space and we can, can get into the situation where we can measure a finite holding or half the uh, current and correspondingly also the conductivity. Now, and uh, our idea, idea was to look at the phonons. Yeah. Is it impossible to drive the phonons in the regime where well, some uh, spontaneous transition in such a phase becomes possible? Now, if we are talking about phonons, of course, we have to look at the possible uh, appropriate phonon mode. and. Uh, on honeycomb lattices, there is a plenty of modes. Not all of them are suitable for our classes of consideration. We want only to look at the so-called E6 mode, which basically describes your uh, oscillation of two sublattices against each other. Yeah. You, you can see it in these two uh, cartoons. So uh, one sublattice moves in the opposite direction to another sublattice and also in, in two directions, so in y direction and x direction. And this motion of two sublattices co corresponds to electrical co electronic current. Why? Because if you look at two neighboring sides on honeycomb lattices and you shift them against each other, the distance between both becomes smaller, the potential bar barrier between the both becomes more shallow, and it's simply supports the hopping process between these two lattice, uh, lattice sites. So basically it, it makes the hopping process between more probable, so more likely. Now, if we move apart from each other on the upper side case, we come closer to, to the second counterpart. And by this way, well, by, by this oscillation, you can always, if you apply some, some uh, a gradient of electrical field, you can basically support the hopping processes from one lattice to each other, to, to the another, some lattice space to another. And uh, this basically means that you couple the phonons to electronic current. And this precisely the mode which we are interested in. Now, the interesting thing is that those are the so-called longitudinal uh, optical modes. Yeah? And they happen to be massive, which basically means they are more or less, more or less, this is the spectra of the both transverse and longitudinal modes, they are more or less monochromatic né, all over the brilliant zone. Né? You can approximate them in the first approximation to the first to the crudest approximation by a constant. Now, there are, of course, some oscillation around some mean value, but they are small. Look at the um, this, so energy scale. They are small. You can neglect them in the crudest approximation. And this neglectance of, of this oscillation around some mean value results in the fact that you can put the canonic momentum in the Hamiltonian to zero. So you only consider so this part, which is a so-called canonic position, right, which couples to the gap parameter or as a sort of frequency of eigenfrequency of those optical modes. So, you know. so and this is the Hamiltonian, which we are working with. So the first term is electronic term, it's simple. Electrons hopping from between the neighboring sides. And the second term is describes your coupling between phonons and electrons and also the kinetic energy term for phonons. Altogether, it is a very interesting um, model, well, basically not even known by us. It, it has been introduced some time ago, but different people. But it looks like very much like a two-dimensional quantum electrodynamics. Quantum electron dynamics in an effective and simplest way. You know, this is also the Hamiltonian first quantized uh, language. In the simplest way, it's, it's simply if we go into a low energy approximation where the electronic Hamiltonian simply reduces to Dirac Hamiltonian, we have a 
action or so Hamiltonian, which only depends on two parameters. The first parameter is with G, it's phononic parameter, it's phononic frequency, which is, by the way, uh, more or less constant. And second one is the Fermi velocity. And this Fermi velocity can be adjusted from outside. You can shine the light, you can shift, uh, let's say, put energy into your system and drive your system by, by um, increasing the so kinetic energy of electrons into some different phase. Now the both parameters, the two, this is a two parameter model and both parameters will basically describe which phase is possible in such a system. If we merge them together to this G bar, so we recognize that the beta function or it's the simplest renormalization group, the beta function, which basically gives us an idea about possible uh, phases which might occur here, changes the sign from, it, it goes for, 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 for simple, for small G it, it is negative, for large G is positive, which basically means that something happens in that system. If G is small, then we don't have any right or it's a chance to assume that something happens to our system. It is a weakly coupled system. In this weakly coupled system, the electronic properties simply dominate. We don't have anything but uh, more or less um, a bit disturbed or perturbed Hanukkah platter, so it's nothing interesting. What happens there? If G becomes larger, then it might happen that this right side becomes positive, so it grows and grows and grows unstoppable. So basically, you should push a lot of energy into the system, and the system has somehow to react. Yeah? And uh, you can't say at this point how does the system react, but you can assume that so phonons become dominant, which means that something happens to to your lattice. And we can expect that something like a gap opens in the system. Well, basically, the question is somehow how to describe it in more microscopic terms, and is it impossible to well, become more uh, accurate or more precise on what happens? And it is indeed possible. So basically, this idea, this simple randomization group floor, gives us lots of information, and we know where to look at. And we perform some what is a microscopic analysis. I don't want to, to bother you with all the technical quantities. So the idea is simply we take the vector phonons and replace them by matrix phonons. It's possible. It's mathematically absolutely uh, well well justified. Can be done in all the necessary um, details and so on and so on. So. This is the idea. You replace a vector like phonons by matrix like phonons. In this case, in this way, you simply introduce some sort of effective degrees of freedom, which might become necessarily important and dominant and say so strongly coupled regime. And simply look at those possibilities. And after all, we want to calculate the conductivities from DC, from Cooper formula. And this is also the Cooper formula, how it looks like. It's simply current current correlator, the usual formulation. Now we have introduced this matrix-like representation of phonons, and it is necessary to look at the ground states, which ground states are allowed by this structure of our symmetry of, of our model. And what we recognize, yes? Uh, I mean, could you go to the previous slide? <laughs> this one? Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to confirm something. So this is essentially, to me, it looks pretty much like a sigma model. So I just wanted to confirm that it, it really is. No, it is not sigma model because sigma model, you have always to um, pick up a subset, which is symmetric with respect to some, some symmetry group. Uh, in this particular case, it is not because you simply, you simply replace, you, you simply um, say, in terms of the usual quantum mechanics, you go from the Schrodinger quantum mechanics of let's say so states into the von Neumann quantum mechanics of density matrices. It's more or less uh, this parallel. You you simply give up the idea of let's say so uh, states on Hilbert space and switch into the representation of quantum mechanics in terms of density matrices. It's very crudely, but it's more like more or less like like this because. You, you can see here, this is the let's say, so current operator. And because you can rewrite it as, as a trace you know, of, of around, over all some, some, some sort of, of matrix. You know? 
And then you decouple not in terms of, of this, uh, this is all, uh, uh, scalars, but in terms of those matrices. So basically you decouple every single matrix element of this matrix by a corresponding Hubbard Saturn field. Ah, okay, okay, mm -hmm. thanks. You're welcome. Okay, may I keep? All right, and now again, we arrive at this nonlinear um, action and this nonlinear action has diff several ground states. Now we recognize here a massless ground state if G is smaller than some critical G and we recognize also the massive state which, uh, uh, or which appears or in which the system switches if the uh, interaction becomes larger than some critical value. And this critical value matches very well with the renormalization group, uh, with the value which has been uh, obtained from the renormalization group. So it is indeed there are several ground states and interesting thing is, well, basically there is also well, this ordered ground state reveals uh, Z2, the general well, if for, for experts, and it is interesting to look at the how conductivity in this massive phase because we want to be sure we want to be sure that it is indeed a whole phase and we want to be sure that indeed we can uh, describe in this way and transition to the let's say phase with broken sublight symmetry with broken temperatures or something all this uh, stuff. Now for this we have to calculate the uh, quantum oscillation terms. It's very difficult. Well, basically, not not very difficult, but it's quite technical. You get for one particular one single cone, you get uh, eight by eight matrix of this structure, and it is already at this level. Well, this this matrix has a lot of uh, interesting information, and I can say some words later if you would like. But necessary at this point is that this matrix is positive definite. All the eigenvalues are positive. And that basically means the Boltzmann weight of our uh, functional integral exists. So we can perform a functional integration, we can calculate the partition function. And in particular case, if we want to calculate the Kubo formula, uh, for, uh, whole conductivity from a Kubo formula, you, know, you can recognize that matrix element of a Kubo formula in this language has a counterpart in, in, the, in, the, in the action, which basically means at some point you, you get something finite. The question is just what kind of finite is, and if you go all through these calculations, what comes out of all this calculation is a simple number, one half times a second man. It's precisely the well that we have expected. And it is a bit of, of a miracle if you go through all this highly complicated calculation that at the very end, you simply get with this number. One half. Well, um, thing is that it was the consideration of one particular cone and um, we want to still to take the chiral symmetry between the cones into account, which basically means the matrix size of initial of your microscopic models becomes twice as large as in the case of one particular cone. And this is the Hamiltonian, and you can recognize these two cones have different chirality here by, by different signs. We also know how the interesting phonon mode couples to this system. It's, it was given by Basco and Alina in this very interesting paper. So basically what we make here, we take our model and we couple it to the phonons in the way Basco and Alina set us to do. The full thing becomes very large, uh, very uh, a lot more complicated than for one particular cone, which I was talking about. I don't want to rather you have all this necessary basically technical details. Interestingly, is simply the structure of ground states, okay? of ground state in this massive phase, because, because of this increasing size of a matrix, matrix space, you have also increased size, number of stable ground states. Okay? So you have here this um, quasi Mexican hat structure where you recognize, first of all, one phase I was talking about previously for one particular, or basically this Haldane-like state, but also yet another stable state. Why, why is stable? We can recognize that those 
thesis are stable because they lie in the middle of some confining potential. It is confined, it is convex in all directions, so it, it has a well-defined minimum. And this basically gives us already an idea that it is well, the, must be stable because once the system switches into this minimum, it cannot escape unless you drive it out of this. This is a uh, minimum. So we have twice degenerated ground state. Of course, there are some symmetries which allow you to switch between those ground states, but it's not interesting at, at this moment. We just want to calculate the whole conductivities in every given minimum. And it is always, it is again possible if you calculate, you simply get a number, again, a simple number. So it's again, it's huge matrices which you have to diagonalize, but uh, at the very end, you simply get a final number, which is, by the way, twice the number which you have for one particular cons, which basically says you both cons contribute to this conductivity on equal footing. So it's precisely what we want to have. So for going from, from this point, we can say, yes, it is possible to describe, it is really possible to describe transition the transition in this whole phase by switching by coupling places or electrons to phonons. And the very last technical slide, it is also interesting to look at the structure of the topological terms which correspond to every given minimum, to this minimum to that minimum, because it turns out that they are different. While in this minimum, we have more or less a usual integer quantum hole-like situation. In this minimum, it is more, or less, more like a fractional quantum hole situation. And you can see it on, 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 on the shape, on the form of a so-called John Simon's terms. So in this phase here, it is nothing but a usual John Simon's term, of course, expressed as some very fancy and difficult um, quantum fields. If you go in this term, you have this uh, uh, yet another John Simons, the so-called K matrix or generalized uh, John Simons term, which usually appear, well, if you try to describe some fractional all systems. And also in this case, you can guess how the respective or corresponding tight binding Hamiltonians might look like. You can construct them. Yeah? And you recognize that in this case of, of one of those say minima, you have something like a Halden-like like, um, model, which basically, you know, uh, is basically generates the situation where both cones are gapped with a, with a mass with different sign and yet another um, representation corresponds to something which people usually call the modulation or modulated strain uh, models. Yeah, and by that I'm, basically done with my talk and so I'd like to conclude maybe with a last uh, remark that all this stuff can be also translated with some work, with some additional work to the case of the um, superconductors yeah, which we are currently working on. And this is the conclusion of my talk since of, with that I'm very thankful for your attention. Thank you very much. So Thank you, Andre, for this talk. Uh, and, uh, questions so, um, from the audience. Uh, Andreas, I have maybe one question. So uh, you say the phonons can be regarded as effective uh, gauge fields, but then uh, phonons, uh, but these are dynamical gauge fields, so to say, right? So, for yes. instance, so uh, uh, how is that? Uh, is that important as compared to maybe gauge fields which are uh, static? Yet again, also the, it is of course the, the dynamical gauge fields, but because you are considering the gap as a transversal or as an optical modes, yeah, optical modes are known to be to be gapped. Yeah? To the crudest approximation, you simply can neglect the dynamics. And the dynamics appears here in terms of this uh, canonical momentum. So the crudest approximation, well, basically you have to perform some calculations. It's 
the first way to, to keep uh, all as simple as possible. So effectively, they get rid of all the dynamics and only consider the static phonons, which, which can basically is, is, is uh, accessible to the driving from outside. So you mean that you basically uh, remove the uh, dispersion? The eigen dispersion, but it's, you, you see, the dispersion around this, this mean value, you know, it's, it's not really much. It, it is not an acoustic phonon where you can't do this because it, it has really, it, it goes to zero, it is massless, no? it's, it's the center of, of the brittle zone, no? the acoustic. But this mod, it is more or less constant all of the brillant zone. You, you can, well, with a good degree of, of accuracy, just neglect it. And this is what people usually call, I do not remember, but it's, it's more or less what people uh, do with this optical modes in first approximation. You simply regard it as monochromatic. And by the way, because they are monochromatic, they are highly occupied and they are easy to, 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 to deal with in experimental sense. But in principle, it could happen that uh, perhaps you can drop uh, this, uh, you can neglect this dispersion in some calculations, but it might as well happen that uh, you need this uh, weak but non-zero dispersion for some, uh, in order to, uh, to keep uh, up some uh, uh, symmetry properties. Which, in other words, if you assume that you have truly dispersionless phonons, maybe you will not be able to uh, to uh, actually uh, come up with the same results if you start from scratch. But I'm... No, it is also, it is not quite be so because... Um, it is also possible to do this if you correctly take, or not, not correctly, but fully take the dispersion into account. Um, I mean, a two-dimensional quantum electrodynamics. Now, I mean, yes, now the quantum electrodynamics in high energy sense. It is shown that you, you have a spontaneous breaking or chiral symmetry there. So from this point of view, it is it not, uh, in, two, you, you, in high energy, you simply take a radiation field and couple it to two electrons. Yeah? The radiation field is of course gap, gapless. You have to take all the dispersion into account. I mean, uh, the dispersion of, of phonons, and it is nonetheless it, it leads you to 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 this effect that uh, chiral symmetry breaking can occur, time reversal symmetry breaking can occur. So for this reason, I uh, I'm been absolutely I'm I'm absolutely confident that if if you take this small fluctuation, you you will you will have the same result for for let's say so well, massive. This was not my my uh, concern. My concern was what. If you assume from scratch that you have completely dispersionless optical phonons, yes. uh, would you then maybe run into some uh, problems with your whole construction or not? Well, I doubt it. Let's say so, because it is again you you have to you have two sectors in your model in your model a phonon sector and a fermion sector. And they compete to some extent. So you can always have a regime where electrons also dominate and where phonons dominate. Uh, for this reason, well, phenomenologically, it, it must still hold if you take all the dispersion into account fully into account. Thank you. You get some additional, yeah, the corrections, but you will certainly have this, this transition. It is. What people usually call also the piles transition, and it is shown to be quite generic. Thank you. There's a question by Alexei. Alexei, please unmute and ask. Yeah, well, actually, it's a continuation of what Sergey was asking. Uh, so, am I correct in thinking that basically when you assume the flat dispersion and that essentially you effectively think of this uh, phonon gauge fields as static, is, uh, that you have Basically, you assume that the time scale of the phonons is much larger than the electrons. Time scale of phonons is much larger than. Oh, time scale of, of like 
mo movement of phonons is much larger because that to me sounds like a reasonable uh, yes it's, uh, maybe correct in, in in this regime where we effectively don't see any, any deformation of the lattice or so that's maybe what you are meaning but it not might not be necessary if you go into this strongly coupled so strongly interacting regime where everything just can switch as in this particular case well okay but in that case you then i mean in the strongly coupled regime then you uh, you have to take into account the kinetic energy of phonons uh, yes but it is well in this particular case the kinetic energy of phonons is generated from this logarithmic term if you now start to expand this this term around well, you you have this this say uh, ground state and you go in, in a particular ground state here and this, you start expand this, this term uh, but it is not a kinetic energy which is you know, so, so it's on uh, phonons own kinetic energy it's a kinetic energy which is due to interaction with electrons the electron gives its energy to to phonon and uh, in this way the, phon the phonon acquires a uh, dispersion right? as you can see here right? This is more or less a phonon so action to simplest or two linear two linear order in, in gradients, and you you see here these these uh, frequencies. Yes, you can also include some higher order gradients here, and of course it it, it means that the phonon acquires a effective kinetic energy. Yes, yeah, I agree. With you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And one more question. So. Um... These were all, uh, this was all done for Kagom, uh, sorry, for honeycomb lattice. Honeycomb, honeycomb lattice, yes, yes. Yeah, uh, what about, I mean, other, other lattices? Uh, say, um, I think one example that I was trying to come up with during the talk was something like Kagome, where I think, uh, uh, well, I'm not sure you have the direct cones, but I think they're. Uh, yeah, you, you have nodal points, but they, they're lying. Uh, Far above the the, the um, Fermi surface, no? you have two extended bands. You have one flat band. The flat band is some somewhere in within the uh, Fermi C, and nodal points they lie above or at half I mean, they lie uh, lie above the well. Half filling is, is probably here not not applicable. This word, but they are say in 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 valence valence band, yes. So you have to go first. Uh, you adjust your fantasy to, to to the position of these nodal points, and then <clears throat> maybe it is all applicable. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure because you also have to look at the uh, spectrum of phonon on, on Kagome and how it looks like there. And so I'm not quite familiar with that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Another quick question, Anja. So in the earlier part of your talk, you were discussing this light, which, which is the transmission of light by changing this angle, right? And there you were looking things as a function of the strain. Um, what if it is not a function. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, but uh, rather than, I mean, looking at the strain properties, uh, what if you look at this angle dependence with respect to some nonlinear features in your model, like Coulomb interaction, or some phonon interaction with this um, electronic structure. So then well, to some extent, to some, yes, uh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, to some extent, well, basically, to the question of phono, uh, Coulomb interaction on Hanukkah lattices, it is not quite clear why it is so weak. Yeah? Because if you calculate the uh, screening, yeah, the effective screening of a Coulomb potential, you never will find something like a Thomas for me uh, mm -hmm. length on, on, on Hanukkah lattices. It is always, it is always extended. Yeah, if you calculate from the first point, so basically to take a look at the polarization mm -hmm. bubbles and it is, it is, it, is, it, is, it has always, it does not have any, any mass. It doesn't produce a strong screening. So it is apparently always let's say extended and it is not quite clear why it is so weak. Yeah? Basically, some people expect that if you go into an ultra quantum limit where you only have those unscreened uh, direct points, something might, must, must happen there, but it's, it's more or less. Well, basically, it's experimentally hardly accessible. For this reason, people do not 
bother themselves with this in-plane Coulomb interaction. It's interesting if you start looking at some some layered structures where you have this intra-layer Coulomb interaction right. because you then you you can oh, this is a completely different situation. So, for this reason, you can be trusted to roughest uh, approximation just to neglect all the uh, Coulomb related or Hubbard or something like this. So you don't consider them and still the free electrons give you a reasonable description of the physics. So for this reason, well, basically non-interacting models, it is what you are usually working with. This stuff. Now to phonons. Phonons, you see, we put some pressure on our system and this external pressure, it is it's there, it is correspond to highly to, to huge forces, and if you translate it into usual force. So again, some uh, eigendynamics of, of the lattices is absolutely irrelevant and uh, in this case. And uh, this this experiment is by the way only done for, for the case where you have this, this situation, right? this this uh, uh, situation where both Dirac points have come together and, and basically the full information about directness is already gone, has already gone. And you, in the sense, you keep your system in such a string or as I said, and under such pressure that any, any what is this, or mutual oscillation of, of lattice size, uh, they don't really play any role. So in these models, uh, at least in, uh, in this honeycomb lattice structures, you will have no form of non-linearity. Just a tight binding model works perfectly fine. Yes, it works but, perfectly but, well. It's, uh, it's I'm, I'm how just, good it works. So another point I was just curious about is because you're shining the light perpendicular yes. to the sample, right? I mean, uh, how if it's a layer thin sample, how do you do this experimentally? I mean, you want to still calculate a transmission through it, right? Yeah, so it's experimental. So you cannot put it on then. a substrate or something. I mean, uh, if you put it usually, on a substrate, then yes. phonons will come into play. So, what usually how people usually produce the strain? They take this is a sheet of graphene. So, may it be graphene? Simply they perform say some some profile. This is a mechanical profile. It's something like. Really, so a mechanical structure or something like a rock put on some sublayer. They put the graphene sheet on the top and they stretch it. Yeah. And because you, you have uh, steel, or well, basically, a conical lattice is not quite symmetric. Right? It's, it's, it's not a Bravais lattice right? in that sense. You don't have uh, this. Also, so the um, Moduli, how does it call? I am I'm not quite. I cannot remember this word. The, the, the plastic, plus, plus, plastic, 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 plasticity, moduli. They are anisotropic, so you, you always have some direction in which, or basically, depending on what configuration you pick up in your system, in towards which this, uh, this sort of motion of uh, neighboring sides becomes more expressed. Né? So and basically, if you put a two, say neighboring uh, uh, lattice sites apart from each other, what happens in opposite in particular direction, they cl get closer and closer. So in this way, you can pr produce the, again, these this forces which uh, bring you into a situation where, and this also, it has been seen experimentally by this uh, neurons, inelastic neuron scattering, that they don't, uh, they, they, the direct points really move against each other. Right? So, Maybe you cannot get yet into a situation where they have merged, but the motion against each other, it's, it's basically a well, well known experimental and well established experimental technique. And now if you have done this, you can, of course, well, because you, you might not be able to measure the transmittance, but you might be able to measure the reflectance which is basically very much the same because they, it's, it's simply probabilities and they're, this is all concerned to, to unity. You, this is all transmittance plus reflectance plus, yeah. plus, plus, plus uh, absorption must give you one yeah? it's in terms of, 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 of um, intensity of light. And this is precisely, it's, it's absolutely doable. I see. Thanks a lot for that. You're welcome.
Any further questions from the audience? Well, it doesn't seem to be the case, so I think. Yeah, so I think we thank our speaker once again. Uh, there we go. And then. Uh, we take about a five minutes break and come back for the aftermath discussion of the seminar. And yeah, just in about five minutes, the, the Zoom room will be open for us. So, okay. Yeah, we just don't leave. We just stay here, have a coffee and come back. So thank you, thank you all for joining us for this PCSM.